In this video, we are going to introduce the basics of atomic physics. We will look at models of the atom and atomic structure as they have progressed through time, including Thomson's plum pudding model, the Rutherford model, and the Bohr model. We will then take a look at the emission and absorption spectra for atoms and finally briefly discuss the modern model of the atom, the quantum mechanical model. Our understanding of the structure of the atom is constantly evolving. It is an ideal example of the nature of science. Through experimental observations, patterns are recognized and theories are created. Then new ideas spark innovative experiments which provide additional evidence. Sometimes the new evidence falsifies what we thought we knew allowing us a greater insight to the mysteries of the universe. Welcome to Atomic Physics. By the beginning of the 1900s, there had been theories, experiments, and wild guesses of what made up our atomic world. At that time, the electron had just been discovered by J.J. Thompson. His model for the structure of the atom consisted of negatively charged electrons embedded in a uniform matter that had an overall positive charge. It was considered to be akin to plum pudding. For those of you unfamiliar with plum pudding, think of it like raisin bread, where the atom was considered to be a blob of positively charged pudding, the brown stuff, and it contained negatively charged plums, the electrons. That was until the Geiger-Marsden-Rutherford experiment. In this experiment, performed between 1908 and 1913, the scientists encased radioactive radium in lead, except for a small opening. This small opening allowed a beam of positively charged particles, alpha particles, to be directed towards a thin sheet of gold foil. The gold foil was surrounded by a zinc sulfide screen, which would flash green when an alpha particle struck its surface. As mentioned earlier, Thomson's plum pudding model was the accepted model of that time, and Geiger, Marsden, and Rutherford wanted to confirm this. As they knew their radioactive particles were small and positively charged, they expected to see that all of the particles would go through the positively charged pudding or that perhaps the positively charged pudding was so dense that none of the alpha particles would get through and they would all be reflected back. Either way, their experiment would confirm the uniform density of charge in the atom. Neither of these hypotheses were observed. Instead, while most of the particles did go through the gold foil and end up on the backside of the screen as predicted, a very small proportion of the particles were scattered at large angles, including some that were reflected back towards the detector. This led the scientists to conclude that there must be a very small, dense, positively charged nucleus at the center of the atom. Their discovery disproved Thompson's model of the atom. The model they developed was the nuclear, or Rutherford model, where most of the atom was empty space, except for the small, dense, positively charged nucleus. The electrons were in random orbits around the nucleus, with the electrostatic force providing the centripetal force for the orbit. There were, however, problems with the model. It was known from Maxwell's equations of electromagnetism that accelerating charges emit radiation. And so, the orbiting electrons should release energy as they orbit, and then spiral down to eventually collide with the nucleus and collapse the atom. Noting the flaws in the Rutherford model of the atom, Niels Bohr developed his model of the atom, which had electron orbits that represented allowed energy states, where electrons could exist without losing energy, or spiraling into the nucleus. Thus, the energy states of electrons in atoms are considered quantized. This may look familiar to you, as it is often the first model to be introduced to students. The atom still has a positively charged nucleus containing protons and neutrons, but compared with Rutherford's model, Bohr suggested the revolutionary idea that electrons jump between energy levels or orbits in a quantum fashion, that is, without ever existing in an in-between state. In other words, electrons cannot occupy just any space around the nucleus. In fact, they can only occupy certain orbits. These orbits correspond to different amounts of energy or energy levels. For a hydrogen atom, the simplest of all elements, having only one proton and one electron, here are the electron energy levels. The energy level diagram shows the energy level number and the amount of energy at the electron's different energy states. The lowest energy state, called the ground state, n equals 1, is, in this case, negative 13.6 electron volts. For the subsequent levels, called excited states, n equals 2 to n equals 5, the diagram shows the amount of energy associated with the different energy levels. 
When an electron transitions between two levels, the energy involved will be the difference in the energies of the two levels. To calculate the energy at each level, we use the equation E is equal to negative 13.6 divided by N squared, where E is the energy associated with the level in electron volts, and N is equal to the energy level number. If an electron is given enough energy such that its energy becomes positive, the electron will leave the atom and the atom will become ionized. Notice that the energy associated with each level is finite. For energy level transitions to occur, an electron must gain an exact amount of energy matching the energy difference between the two levels. The energy to make these transitions can come from energy packets of light called photons. When an electron absorbs a photon with the exact amount of energy, the electron can jump to a higher energy level. When the electron returns to a lower energy level, it releases a photon with the amount of energy equal to the energy difference between quantized levels. As an example, for an electron of hydrogen to go from its ground state to energy level n equals 3, the electron must absorb negative 1.5 minus a negative 13.6, which is equal to 12.09 electron volts of energy. If the electron then jumps down from n equals 3 to n equals 2, it releases a photon with an energy of negative 3.4 minus a negative 1.51, which is equal to a negative 1.89 electron volts of energy. In Bohr's research, he theorized that the frequency of the photon absorbed or released during the electron transition represents the energy required for each energy level jump. He made use of Max Planck's relationship, E equals HF, to relate the frequency of the photon to the difference in energy between the levels. Looking at the equation, we see that E is the energy carried by a photon, H is Planck's constant, and F is the frequency in Hertz. Notice that the units of Planck's constant are joules times seconds. If you want to get the frequency of a photon, you must convert the energy required from electron volts to joules. To do this, multiply the number of electron volts by the charge of an electron, 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Combining the photon energy frequency equation with the wave equation, we can also determine the wavelength of the photon. The wave equation is V equals F lambda, where V is the velocity, F is frequency, and lambda is the wavelength. When dealing with photons and electromagnetic radiation, the velocity is equal to the speed of light, C. Solving the equation for F, we get F equals C divided by lambda. Then substituting in C divided by lambda for F, we get E is equal to H times C divided by lambda. To solve for the wavelength, we multiply both sides by lambda and divide both sides by energy. The resulting equation is that the wavelength of a photon is equal to H times C divided by E. If an element in its gaseous form is heated or has electricity passed through it, its electrons will move to excited states. When the electrons transition back to the lower energy states, they release electromagnetic radiation of specific frequencies corresponding to the difference in energy of the different electron states for that element. These frequencies or emission spectra show up as bands of light when viewed through a spectrometer or diffraction grating. Different elements and compounds have characteristic emission spectra. By analyzing the emission spectra of unknown compounds or even stars, we can gain insight into the chemical compositions of these unknown entities. Absorption occurs when a continuous spectrum of light is incident on a gaseous element or substance, and the electrons of the substance absorb photons with the correct amount of energy corresponding to the differences in energy levels in that element. On a continuous spectrum, the frequencies that are being absorbed are seen as black lines that have been removed. It is no coincidence that the black lines that appear on the absorption spectrum are the same frequency that are emitted in the emission spectrum. As the light passes through the gas, the photons that are absorbed excite electrons in the gas. They are then re-emitted as photons in all directions as the electrons return to lower energy states. The specific frequencies that are absorbed match those that are re-emitted, and so, the emission and absorption spectra of the same element correspond exactly to one another. As shown in the above diagrams, the absorption frequencies of hydrogen and helium are different, as they are for all elements. In that way, the absorption spectra can also be used to analyze the chemical composition of structures. The culmination of all of this scientific research is our current understanding of the nature of the atom, the quantum mechanical model. 
In this model, there is a dense nucleus that contains positively charged protons and neutral neutrons. The negatively charged electrons, now considered matter waves, are located around the nucleus. We can't really say for sure where they are located, but we can say the probability of where they may show up. The modern model of the atom and the probability density of an electron can be represented in many different ways, including cloud diagrams, graphs showing electron probability versus radius from the nucleus, and through equations, notably the Schrodinger equation. These advanced models are typically beyond the scope of high school physics courses. While this is our current understanding of the atom, we still use the previous models as stepping stones to understand the quantum mechanical model and understand how science has evolved with the development of the atomic model. In summary, over the last hundred or so years, curious and innovative scientists have refined our understanding of the atom, giving us our current view. An atom is composed of a nucleus with positively charged protons and neutrally charged neutrons. The rutherford geiger marsden experiment discovered that the nucleus is surrounded by mostly empty space, where negatively charged electrons can be found. The energies of these electrons are quantized, meaning they are restricted to certain energy levels. The electrons can transition between energy levels by absorbing or emitting energy in the form of a photon. The energy involved in these transitions and characteristics such as frequency and wavelength can be determined mathematically. Each element has characteristic emission and absorption spectra that reflect its electron energy states. These spectra can be used to identify the composition of substances. Thanks for watching and learning with us today.